Hello, Maz Khan. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and to talk to you guys about culture because it's very, very precious to me. It's more precious than money. It's what keeps me going, right? It's what I, it's what I love. So I want to start with a personal story. And it's, it's a little embarrassing for me. Um, I was very early in my career, and I worked for a company that had, was, I would say, moderately successful, that was full of very talented people. They worked very hard. They had good values. But it was still a very, very challenging place to work. Uh, other people could use an environment toxic, right? It was a toxic environment. Uh, people would leave maybe crying once a week. There was a lot of passive aggressive email going around. There were these like shifting cold wars, right? Where it's like, oh, I guess so and so is not talking to so and so. And if I talk to them, then they're going to think I'm somehow not being loyal to them. It was a very, it was like a lot of wasted energy. I mean, just tons and tons of worry and time spent, like, ah, oh, why are they doing that? Why, are they, why can't we just do things like normal people? Like, it's just a lot of effort that wasn't productive. You guys don't know me very well. Some of you know me very well. Most of you don't know me very well. And I'm not usually this, I mean, I am a hippie, but I'm not like this hippy dippy. I, lit, I was working there and I had a dream and it was one of these dreams that's very emotionally potent, right? It doesn't happen very often, but once or twice a year, I'll have a dream where I like, I'm, I fight with my husband and I'll wake up still mad at him. And I'll be like, man, honey, I can't believe you, you know? And it takes like a half an hour for it to like kind of wear off slowly. Or you'll have a dream, a good friend moves away and you're very sad. Well, in this dream, I had a dream that I quit my job quit my job and I was so happy. I started laughing. I, like, I started laughing and I woke up laughing. I've never done that before or since. <laughs> I woke up laughing. I mean, that's crazy, right? So I gave my notice the next day. So I'm, it's, you know, many years later, I reflect back on that. I didn't take that path. I basically bailed out on that organization. I will never know if I could have been a change agent. Is there something I could have done that would have helped push that culture forward? I don't know. I'll never know. I showed no leadership whatsoever. Just bailed. All right, on to, on to happier topics. New beginnings. I started at Moz. And it was so exciting, right? Because it was small. I was the eighth employee, and like there were so many smart and creative people there, and we were all friends, and and it was even family. Like some people were literally family, and the rest of us felt like family. And uh, I was like, these guys, I know they're great. They have great values. This is going to be awesome, right? And there were a lot of things that were awesome. There were also a lot of challenges. We had no effing idea what we were doing. We still don't know a lot, but we knew even less than <laughs> possible. We knew even less than. We didn't know how to build products. We didn't know how to run like finances. We didn't know how to hire. We didn't know how to fire. We had really no pricing. Like we don't know pricing for anything, right? We were just we had a lot of effort and heart, and we knew that we loved marketing and that we wanted to make big changes. But the day to day was really challenging, and those relationships began to suffer, like really precious relationships, right? And it was, it was like hard work. And I'm like, oh, I was, oh man, is it happening again, right? Well, luckily, luckily, we have a woman on our board, Michelle Goldberg, who I believe is actually here. Thank you, Michelle, shout out. Um, and she pushed us in a board meeting in this challenging time period to do some values work. And we were like, you know, we have values. We have values. We all know we have values. So, you know, we have real problems to solve. We have, like, real, we don't need a group hug right now. So we're very, you know, we were very reluctant to go down that path. We thought of Enron, right? Enron had their values etched in marble in the lobby. So it's like, clearly, what's the point of sitting and talking about values? You know, we already know we have them. So what's the point? Um, luckily, one of Michelle's great qualities is she's quietly persistent. Quietly, she's like, well, you know, good company like Disney does it, NASA does it, 
GE does it, you know, you've read that good to great guy, you know, a lot of people seem to think that's a thing, so you guys maybe should think about it. It's like, all right, okay, we'll think about it. And we did. We actually spent the next year and a half talking about it, and we, we had, a, we had a, a quick draft that we developed um, in, in like a three month period, doing intensive like one to one discussions about it and over email. And some of the values were really obvious right away. Like transparency has always been a big part of our lexicon. Generosity has always been a big part of our lexicon. You know, Rand is a champion for transparency like from his core, right? So it's like, well, clearly transparency's gotta be in there. Jillian was always focused on generosity to the team. So clearly generosity was something important. Others of them took more time. So it was a, basically a year and a half later before we had what you guys know, or many of you know, is tag fee today. And for those of you who don't know, Tag fee means we are transparent, we are authentic, we're generous, we're fun, we're empathetic, and we're exceptional. And that's tag fee. So the amazing thing is that I actually, it worked. It really worked. It brought us back together. And it wasn't in the ways we thought it would, right? It wasn't like, I wasn't all part of the plan. It kind of evolved where when you stop focusing on all the stuff you disagree about, because you're always going to disagree, and that's, that's good. Like, disagreement happens. But when you can focus on the most important thing is that we agree that we need to be empathetic to others, that we need to be generous to ourselves and to our community, to our customers, to our teammates. When we want to be transparent, is always going to be a value. When we want to be honest, authentic, you know, suddenly it takes motivation entirely off the table. You don't have to be like, well, geez, you know, I didn't realize he was such a jerk. Maybe I had that guy pegged all wrong. It's like, yeah, you know he's not a jerk because you already know he's committed to those values. Puts you back in learner mode, and instead of questioning their motives, you're like, I must not be seeing what he is seeing. Hmm. Help me see what you're seeing, and let me help you understand where I'm coming from. So back in learner mode, very, very important. Some other benefits of doing such great values work. Way more efficient communication, right? I mean, we have, we have discussions all day, every day. There are many different ways to do things in this world, and so we hash them all out. We like to talk. We like to email. So, wow, it's way better to already have a sort of agreed upon criteria of which we're gonna judge success. So we can quickly get to the bottom line and say, okay, well, our bottom line, which is tag B, right? Well, uh, what's transparent? What would be a transparent thing to do? What's the generous thing to do? What would be really exceptional, right? But way faster than being sort of like, I don't know, I feel like for me, an outcome would be something like blah, blah, blah. We already know, we're already there. It's also really helpful when you're trying to explain decision making, right? Like one of the most awful things is when you have to ask a team member to leave. God, that's just, it's awful to do. And then to talk about it with everyone else is also really challenging because you want to respect that person's privacy, but you also want to like, let the team know, hey, we had to make this really you know, sad decision that impacts everyone here because we all have relationships and care about each other. So I want to be transparent and share with you, but I have to be empathetic to that person that we asked to leave, and I can't talk about all the whys. So that is a very complicated conversation because there's a lot of competing values Right, But when you at least have agreed upon code, you can shorten that conversation up a little bit. I love this. And so another thing I don't think we fully like, really got at the time, incredibly virtuous recruiting cycle, right? People who are tag fee tend to know and hang out with other tag fee people. And I mean that from like a recruiting internally great team members. Love y'all, see a lot of blue shirts. And also external people, external people like, Everyone else is here today, right? I, whether you know it or not, whether you're conscious about it or not, a lot of you are probably here because of tag fee. It may not be you even knew about tag fee, but you probably saw something that tag fee is a reflection of that helped bring you here today for us to have this wonderful interchange. Same thing with vendors, right? We want to work with great vendors who are like us because we don't want to have to like deal with other people's sort of business practices, right? Like this is the way we do. We want to work with people who feel the way we do about it, right? Oh, it's awesome. Engagement, engagement. So your top people, if you don't have a culture where they can live with integrity and in their values every day, if they're like 
like I was, right? At an organization where you're like, oh my God, there is so much waste and I'm way too stressed out and I got other stuff to stress out about. They're gonna just leave, they're gonna bail. They're gonna bail. And even if they don't bail physically, they're gonna bail emotionally. They're gonna disengage. They're gonna be present, but not really be engaged, right? We wanna avoid that. And you know, it's, it comes and goes too, right? It comes and goes. Engagement comes and goes. We wanna keep everyone fully, fully locked on. Why? Because when people are engaged, they care. They care, and if you care about something, you speak your mind. When you care, you say, you know, why are we doing it that way again? Or is that really the right goal? Did we look at this other thing? People who care are gonna tell you what they think. They're gonna offer stuff to you. They're gonna work hard, because they care. If they don't care, they're like, hey, whatever guys, I'm just doing my job. Just don't look at me and get out of here. So engagement, very critical. Success beyond success. So I have, I have a pet peeve, and like you'll see this kind of be struggling with this even in this, in this presentation. I have a pet peeve when people talk about culture because of all the great business ROI. It's like, oh, it's gonna give you so much cash. Your business is going to rise completely to the top, and that's why you should have culture. I mean, I believe that to be true, but that is not why. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Because that is, it's an end in and of itself to have good culture, to live your life that way. Because success is not about, shouldn't be about, just how much money you generated that day, right? It should be, it should be about what did I contribute to the world and to humanity? And am I proud of myself and how I, how I interacted with others? So success beyond success. When you, when you make that a value, when you say to everyone on your team, it's very important for us to live with integrity. That's primary. Business is also important, but this is primary. Suddenly, you get out of these Enron situations, right? Where it's like, oh, we have these values, but make sure you are growing fast. Grow hard, grow fast, do whatever you have to do. That is most important. We are here to make money, and we wanna be successful, and we wanna be the best, right? So it's, it's what's, your, what's your primary thing? So we will talk about like how it's great for the business, but I wanna be very, very clear that I do it just because. It's kinda like climbing a mountain. Because you're good, you should. You'll feel good if you do it. Okay, what is culture? Sarah, you've been talking about lots of values and I thought this was a culture presentation, so did you get the wrong topic? Good question. For my purposes today, the definition of culture is how things get done around here. It's very simple, how do things get done around here? And every, whoops, did we skip one? No. Every single group has a culture. Every group, every team, every company, even your family has a culture, <sighs> right? And you're like, oh crap, I can think about my family culture, that's a rabbit hole, right? So the question is, are you conscious or not? Are you conscious about your culture? Do you know it? Oops. We use tag -V. this is where values meet up with how things get done around here, right? Values are the standard that we use to judge whether our cult culture is healthy. Is our culture healthy? Very important, I, like again, super pet, like, we're getting into some pet peeves right now, I'm like getting goosebumply. Culture does not equal perks! Oh my God! If I read one more tech article, or, or like even, things that people should know better, that's like the best place to work awards, which we've won a few, and I'm grateful. But like, please do not talk about my perks and my culture. Like, perks can be a nice manifestation of your culture and your values, right? It's not like they're completely unrelated. But perks are neither necessary or sufficient, for those of you who are philosophy geeks, like me, right? Like, it's this other, it's this other thing. Like, there are many, many companies that have great perks and crap culture. So like, let's break free. And I'm gonna go, we're gonna go through and we're gonna like, like dig into culture and what does like culture day to day look like. I am purposefully steering away from a big list of perks. Because you do not need a budget to have a good culture. There's no, you don't need one. Like Moz had tag fee before we had money. We were dead broke and we still had tag fee, right? We were still interested and intentional in our culture. All right, I'm on with Brant. 
rant, end with rant. Okay, so we're gonna use um, Ma's culture as just an example. Right? Everyone, you know, you have your own values, and so, you know, use yours. I'm just gonna walk through, this is good. Some of you already have defined value statements. You may know them, you may not, but think about them, right? And maybe be walking through what yours could be, your own personal ones, your family ones. Transparent. Mahas were transparent. What does that mean to be transparent, right? Well, for us, there's physical things about it, like open desk, open layout. Um, there is, you know, we try not to have too many people stuffed in uh, offices. There is um, tons of information on our wiki. There is so much email. Oh my God, I think one of the biggest struggles at Mahas right now is the amount of email, right? Because transparency is a value, and we really do share everything. I want to be very clear though, like communication is the skill that helps you implement transparency and we have a lot of skill building to do, right? Because if you sat there and you read every email, you would never get any work done at all, right? So, like, so transparency is complicated, we have the value, we still are working on how to do it effectively in many ways. Transparency is also about just sharing what's really bugging you, like I have a different opinion. I have a different opinion about that, I see it differently. Have we thought about this? Like being transparent means sharing that kind of stuff, right? You, if no one is disagreeing in a meeting, that's a transparency problem, right? That's a transparency problem. And of course we're transparent in other ways. You know, uh, Karin went through some great examples. We screw up, everyone screws up. Y'all are gonna screw up, I screw up. Uh, what do you do about it? Do you share it? Not a blamey way, not a blamey way. Just say, well, we screwed up. We're gonna write a blog post. We're gonna talk about it with the community, sorry. We screwed that up. That's transparency in action. Authentic. Authentic is a challenging one, right? What is that really? It's related to transparency. What does it really mean? You know, examples of authenticity in the wild and Moz are we try not to do a lot of corporate speak, you know, like that we don't like give the help team like, okay, you know, make sure you practice your corporate lexicon and get your corporate grammar rules down and you know, thank you very kindly for submitting your request. You know, like, yeah, who talks like that? No one talks like that. I don't want to interact with that person. <laughs> like, I, don't, I like people, not robots, right? And that goes through in, in meetings and like, come as you are, you know? I mean, we got people who, like you saw Evan um, on the unicycle, right? That's just, he's like, that's just who he is, you know? I'm wearing an apron for God's sake and I do it almost every day in the office. Like, that's weird, but it's authentic, you know? It's just, it's just what we are. It's just being true to yourself. It also means like things are really noisy, by the way. Authenticity, like authenticity and transparency tends to get too noisy, but it's delightful because there are these wonderful weird laughers in the office and you know who you are, weird laughers. <laughs> anyway, um, generous, what does generosity look like in the wild? I mean, there's the obvious, right, that we talked about before, there's perks, which can be a manifestation of generosity, but that is not the most important part. So put that over here. Let's focus on generosity. Generosity means kindness. It means generosity of spirit. It means helping somebody, right? One of the things I really appreciate at Moz and this in the wild, like I know I can ask anybody anything. I can say, hey, I need help. And if they can, they're gonna do it for me. There's, you know, other people talk about this in a like no closed door policy kind of way, right? And that's the same thing, right? We talk about it in terms of a generosity. This is another really, really important part. So that's, it's helping others, it's generosity, helping the community, helping your teammates, but it's also being generous in forgiveness and in giving people the benefit of the doubt. Give them, give them the benefit of the doubt. Right, like, gosh, I do not know why they did that. Um, wow, I can't, but they must be crazy. And like, your brain is, the thoughts are coming in, like, oh my God, are they a crazy person? Like, what the hell were they thinking, right? And then you stop those crazy thoughts and you go, wait a minute, I'm gonna be generous here. I'm purposefully and intentionally going to assume that there is way more to this than I know. I'm gonna go back into learner mode and say, you know what? I know that that's a good person and they got good values and like they're smart and know their stuff so there must be something else going on. And I'm just gonna choose to believe that. It makes everything a lot better and then I'm gonna engage them on it. Hey, what's going on, right? That is real generosity. It's free. Fun, okay, fun. I'm actually not gonna spend that much time on fun. Fun's pretty obvious, we know it, we see it. It's laughing, it's hanging out together, it's being silly, it's like we have a cat alias. It's like all the stuff you would expect. We like to hang out. You know, in the old, in the old days, it was like, let's just go on our own pub crawl and you know, walk up and down the Ave in the U District and we'll each buy, we'll all buy our own beers and drinks and we'll have fun that way. 
we'll share silly stuff on the uh, emails and just, I mean, it's just that kind of fun. You know, now we do spend a little more on fun. You know, we'll be like, oh, some of us are gonna ride the Ferris wheel and some teams are gonna do skydiving or like whatever, like we do that stuff too. But we also do like stuff that costs no money, like the potato sculpting contest, mashed potatoes, you have everyone go, create a magnificent sculpture out of mashed potatoes. That's so cheap, so cheap, so fun. Empathy, 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 empathy. Like, no, I love it, I love it. What does empathy look like in action? It does mean talking about your feelings, which is a skill. It's a skill to do that. It takes a lot of self-awareness, which is also a skill. You have to practice stopping yourself and saying, oh, how am I feeling about this? Something's happening right now in me, physically. What's happening? Ooh, this must be fear. This might be anger, this might be sadness, this might be joy, right? So it's, it's a skill. And you always put the other person, you know, you, you, put the, you put yourself in the other person's shoes, right? Empathy, it's probably the most intuitive other than fun. So I don't actually, I'm not gonna spend too much time. Um, exceptional has two meanings. Most of you are probably thinking, oh yeah, high quality, of course, right? Yeah, quality's good, we like quality. But even more, we like being the exception to the rule being different. When, when you're exceptional, you say, okay, let's understand the best practice, and then let's think about how can we do it differently? How can we do it better? What's innovative? What's unique? What's true to ourselves? So exceptional and authenticity can often go hand in hand together. So um, exceptional for us may look like things like, uh, not only are we transparent with our financials um, internally, we're transparent externally. We publish our financials on the web. That's pretty unique, right? That's pretty unique, that's pretty exceptional. It could be, um, for those of you who saw it, we did the most amazing um, meme-based press release when we did our Series B. Hysterical, right, there's like regular press releases and then there's ours and it was a crack up. Exceptional. Okay, so I've been talking about all this good stuff, like okay, Nas commercial, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we do not have everything figured out. I'm gonna talk about some of the things, this is just, this is just a handful of things that we are struggling with. Um, again, I wanna be transparent. Velocity is an issue in our organization. Time to make decisions and implement them. That is a problem in a culture that really values relationships, that values transparency, that's very collaborative, that's very inclusive, because we all wanna weigh in and we all genuinely value everyone else's opinion. So it's not just formal. It's like, really, no, really, how do you think? I really want, I need to know how you think about this. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna ask this person, and how do you think about this, right? And it can take like six months to get everyone's feedback and then, yeah, decide. So velocity, it's a challenge. Um, diver diversity, I don't know for sure it's a challenge, but I worry about it, right? If, you, if the virtuous recruiting cycle is great, but it does mean you tend to get people who are more like the people you already have, and I worry about groupthink. I worry about, you know, do we understand what is just a different style? Like they have my same values, but they have a different style about them versus someone who they like, no, they're not really, they have different, Different values, it's not really the same, right? And what is that line? It's hard to understand. So I worry about that. Disagreement. Oh, I worry about this a lot, like this. So it's, it's hot, like disagreeing in a tag fee way is, whoa, that is like ninja skills, right? This, is a, this is, takes a lot of skill to disagree in a way that is in alignment with your values, that, where you show a lot of integrity. And so it can be hard to do. I wanna, I, we need practice on this. Everyone needs practice on this. Um, I, don't, I very rarely see this, but it was so interesting to me, I wanted to bring it up. Um, I have once or twice seen tag fee used as a weapon, right? We all really wanna be tag fee, and it means a lot, right? We, like, we all wanna be good people, wanna be understood that way to our peers as good people. I've seen once or twice in a meeting just something like, you're not tag fee. And then like, you know, going on with why their idea is the best, right? And it wasn't a meaningful conversation about like, oh, you know, um, is that, what, is what you're suggesting empathetic? Or how is that generous? Because I can see this other, like for me, generous, generosity would look like this. That's a meaningful and interesting dialogue about the values, which is how most decision making gets done. And occasionally though, it can be used as like, ah, tag fee alert. Uh-oh, I can write you off, right? So we gotta watch out for that. In your own cultures too, please, please. So we just went through a lot, we just went through a lot. We went through a lot of good stuff, we went through a lot of bad stuff. Culture is a marathon and not a sprint. It is not a one decision like, wow, we had to do like this one day of like a really big decision for the company and that's gonna define our values forever. It's not like that. In fact, 
really, really interesting research. I've got this resources for you at the end of the deck um, on microaffirmations and microinequities. This is really fascinating. People who experience uh, who experience you know, feeling different, feeling discriminated against in an organization, those organizations usually don't have a formal policy that's like, well, anyone who's got a difference like race or religion or creed or political view, like they will get fired and not promoted. Like no one writes that down, right? And like it's not usually that overt because people are nice people, but you can still have a feeling of discrimination in one way or another. And what they found is it actually comes from these teeny little subconscious movements in your body, right? There, and things you don't think about. So like how profound is this that every single day you are creating the culture subconsciously with your body language? A microaffirmation, maybe something small, like stopping someone in the hallway, looking them in the eyes and being like, wow, that thing you did, I noticed, it was awesome, good. Teeny little affirmation, makes someone feel included. It's a good thing. It could be something smaller, like just saying hi to them in the hall. It could be something like just turning your body language to them, like when they're talking. Yeah, that's microaffirmation. Microinequity is sort of the, is the other stuff. Like maybe there's a room full of people and you say hi to two and you kind of ignore the other one and you're not thinking like anything bad about it, but the other person may experience that as like a subconsciously kind of, ooh, something's not right here. Or in a meeting, you may feel like, I don't get listened to as much as the other. So this is, this creates a lot of responsibility, right? It's a lot of responsibility. Because culture is made up of a thousand small decisions every single day. Thousands of small decisions you may not even know you're making. It's not a policy, it's not a perk, right? That's all part of it. But really the most meaningful thing in your, in your family dynamics, in your small team dynamics, in your big team dynamics, it's these, it's these decisions. That's what really matters. Okay. So, if, it, if we can all have this kind of impact with just our body language, what does that mean? Oh my God. It means that in a conscious culture, in a culture where you are being very intentional about acting with integrity and living with your values, everybody has to play. Everybody has to play. You can't just say like, gosh, Sarah's right, you know? We need to have a more intentional culture. Why isn't my HR team bringing in the culture? Yeah, gosh, my manager is not bringing culture to the team. Geez, my, I just, my CEO doesn't even think about this stuff, right? Like some of you are probably thinking that, right? But guess what? Everybody plays. Everybody plays. And we all have to woo, beware the victim trap. Ooh, this is hard. What is it? What's the victim trap? It's when you only focus on the circumstances that are beyond your control when you have a problem. If all you're thinking about is like, wow, that's the cause of this problem, not me. They did this, they should fix it. That's the victim trap. Feels kind of good, because you're like, it's not my fault, I'm good. Feels good, you just gave up your power entirely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use two quick examples to help make this a little more clear. Okay, a pen. Boom. Why did the pen fall? Why did the pen fall? Some of you are thinking, gravity, gravity, yeah, you're right. That was a major contributing factor. You are correct. But it's also because I dropped it. <laughs> I dropped the pen, that's why, right? They're both right, they're both contributing factors, but like where does your mind go to first? So that's an abstract example to kind of help you see the shift between like when I'm focusing on an external example versus a contribution I may be making to the issue. Now let's go to something that may be a little bit closer to home, right? God, um, uh, I was not able to meet my, my goals, you know, my KPIs are off this month, and guess what, it's because the engineering team, they were so late with that stuff, and they didn't even read the spec right, so what they delivered was wrong. And then the customers are so unreasonable, they have like such high demands, it's like, who thinks this way? Who has these kinds of demands, you know? Well, and then like, what's going on in Europe with their economy right now, putting all this unfair pressure on my customers where they can't buy anything? I mean, God, the economy is just a disaster. Like, those people in like international banking have totally screwed me over, right? Like, you can see like, it's so easy. Oh my God, it's, it feels kind of good, right? Especially doing a group together. Oh my God, can you believe those guys? Whoa, and it's this big like victim love fest thing and it's like, ooh, it's like it feels like, you know, like they're, you're all like dealing a drug together or something, right? Oh, but it's so unhelpful. 
Caitlin is so unhealthy, and you just totally took away your power, and nothing ever, like nothing good ever got done that way. And we've got to learn to identify when we're slipping into that mode, and when see when others are doing it, and help each other push out of it, right? Because we are all players in culture. It is not the CEO's job, and it is not the HR team's job. It's your job. So, hey Sarah, it's your job. When you were in that organization that was so toxic and you bailed, what, what could you have done? What could you have done differently? And some of you who maybe are right now are thinking like, yeah, okay, I'm ready to be a player. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm like, well, what is it? You know, what can we do? Let's kind of brainstorm some stuff. What could we have done differently? Okay. First thing, you just plant, you plant lots of seeds. Nothing ever happens overnight. Uh, you just, you start with, first of all, understanding what your values are. To have clarity on that. And then, this is gonna sound cheesy, but you will get comfortable, like, bear with me, like, it's gonna get comfortable. Talk about them with people. Talk about them with everyone in your organization. And it, the conversation could go something like this. Um, I'm, I'm really committed to uh, honesty and to making this the most productive work environment where everyone feels really safe. I'm committed to X, right? That's, that's my formula, I just, what I'm committed to, my values. Therefore, I would like to talk about how can we have a feedback structure in the organization where we feel like safe and comfortable for you to just come and tell me if you think I'm not being productive enough today, or you think I'm looking at Facebook too much, or you, know, you think I'm, like, I'm late on a project and you're just seething about it, or whatever, right? Like, so there's a structure. I'm committed to X, and so can we talk about why? I tell you if, you, if you, if you do this, it'll start to heighten, heighten everyone's awareness around you about values and what you're trying to accomplish. And no one disagrees with that. They're like, oh yeah, I'm committed to that too. Okay, yeah, right? you, just, you just took motivation off the table and now you're focusing on what you guys can accomplish together. Okay, start with your collaboration team, right? People nearest to you, like I work with you and I work with you really often. Like let's talk about how we three can gel. Start there. Some of you are huge organizations, oh my God. Don't think about that. Start with like what your daily activity is, right? Start there. Gotta start somewhere. Have a conversation about that accountability. So you talk with your team, you stated your values, and you can say, okay, I'm really committed to this. I wanna give everyone here permission to hold me accountable. Like I've told you all today, I'm committed to tag me. I want you to help hold me accountable. And many of you do, and I'm grateful for that. Hold me accountable. And then maybe even eventually follow it up with like, hey, how do you feel about me helping you be accountable? Would that be useful to you if I helped hold you accountable? Would you find that useful? Share resources, I've got a bunch of them, but like, don't make this all about like, I am the guru about this thing. Like, no, there are so many people who've done like great work on this and you should start sharing it and just raise awareness with everyone. Oh, I saw this great article about like, different ways people give feedback or about different team outings or like whatever it is that you think needs some work, share it, share it, collect it. Realize, make people realize they're not the only ones. So even if you do all this stuff and you're living your values and you're being a player and you're doing all the stuff we talked about, you may still fail. You may still fail. In fact, I mean, things, most things in life are partly out of your control. Like there's basically nothing in this world that you control entirely except your own response to that world, right? Except your own response to that failure. So you may still fail. That's really hard. That's really, really hard. But I wanna be real here, right? I wanna be real. So, for example, if I had tried, if I had stayed at that other office and had tried, I might have failed. But I'll tell you what, I would not be living with the sense of sometimes anger and resentment I have towards people in that organization. I wouldn't be living with my own feelings of guilt and a little bit of shame, like I didn't live up to my own standards of leadership. So, I would much rather, on reflection, have tried, tried my best, lived in alignment with my values and failed and then been like, you know what, I did what I could. I'm really, really sad about it. I'm heartbroken, failure sucks. I tried to make change, I tried to do the right thing. This was the right business decision that I hope would work out because it's in alignment with my values and I still failed. But I would rather live that way with a resilient heart and having pride in my values that I did the right thing than guilt and shame. Ooh. Okay, so I wanna give you two pieces, two little like, kernels of wisdom to help you with your kind of uh, dealing with challenge and how do you get your culture, how do you face these culture challenges and business challenges with integrity? One, you're all athletes, right? You're athletes every day. You gotta manage your energy, right? You're like, when you're, 
when you are hitting a wall, when you're like, oh, God, I'm getting so stressed out. I can just not handle these people. I cannot have a good conversation. I am so mad. That's you hitting a wall. Like a professional athlete, you got to back up. you got to be like, okay, i got to do some energy management here. i got a long way to go. Right? It says it's a marathon, not a sprint. So talk about, be aware about your own your own ability to face that challenge. And remember, every day are little challenges, but you're practicing for the big stuff, right? Practice, someday there's gonna be a crisis that is so overwhelming and so awful in your life, and you wanna be ready, you wanna be trained, you wanna be like, okay, I know how to handle this, and I feel confident in my values. Like, you think about great guys like Nelson Mandela, right? Oh my God, he's at the peak, right? That guy, talk about the Integrity Olympics, he is a champ, gold medalist, right? And even people who had um, really sad outcomes, like Martin Luther King, right? Tragic, tragic outcome. Tragic outcome. But we all admire him. We admire him. We revere him. Because he, gold medalist at the Integrity Olympics. Holy crap. Right? How do you want to be thought of? That's how you want to be thought of. My last piece of advice. Make sure you focus on that success beyond success part to unleash your potential, right? If you are focused solely on your People Magazine version of success, am I going to get cash? Am I not going to get cash? Am I going to get the most customers? Am I going to get that promotion? You're going to live in fear. Oh, it's, so, it's scary because so many things are outside of your control, and you live in fear, and you're self-limiting, and you're like, gosh, I, can't, I might fail if I try that, and I'm so, I'm so much anxiety, right? When you focus on, like, the most important thing to me is that I do this in alignment with my values, Wow, suddenly it just unleashes all this creative energy, all this potential. You can lean in. It's only risk capital at stake. I can be bold. I can be bold. What would you do if you weren't afraid? If you weren't afraid of all that People Magazine success and it's out of my control, right? Focus on what you can control. Okay, 30 second recap. This is the like last slide. What did we learn today? Why is she still talking? We learned a lot. Know your values. Commit to them vocally. Invite accountability from other people. Collect and share resources, be a player, create that ripple effect, and most importantly, focus on success beyond success to unleash all of your potential. Thank you. Sarah, uh, no time for questions, yeah. but uh, you've, been, you've been generous with everybody here. Now it's time for fun. The team made you a mimosa. Ah! Cheers! So, thank you so much. Thank God. Thank you guys. Thank you, Cheers.